Good morning. Good morning. And you're all very welcome here to this time of worship here in Dara Moor, and especially if you're a visitor. And I know that there are at least a few folks I haven't seen for a while here today uh, who we would have known in our time dur uh, during our time in Carland. So they are very welcome, along with everybody who's come to worship the Lord today. Just a few announcements before we turn to worship. The men's group are hosting a walking treasure hunt from, I wonder if that's the, the, the treasure hunt walks or do we walk, I don't know. A walking treasure hunt from Drummer Coast Church Hall on Saturday the 18th of June at 7 p.m. This is open to everyone and a barbecue will follow. Names are to be on the sheet in the vestibule by Sunday the 12th of June. Uh, for catering purposes. Also, just to mention that the men's group are planning a visit to Emerald Lawns, uh, details to follow. If anyone has a request for prayer, please leave details in the box in the vestibule. Uh, members of our prayer team will follow up on those requests. Uh, some of you may already know that Drummer Coast PW are organising a Jubilee afternoon tea on Saturday the 28th of May. And Hazlett, who is organising this event, has informed me that there are still some tickets left at £15 each. Anyone interested in attending should contact Anne as soon as possible. Over the coming weeks and months, I want to encourage more participation within our Sunday times of worship uh, with elders and church members doing the Bible readings. Our Clark Sam read last week and we have Helen reading today. Going forward, I hope to see more elders and church members doing the readings each Sunday. When I've been informed of who will be reading at the next service, I will then contact the reader with details of the passage. And I think that probably most folk feel pretty nervous whenever they're standing at the front. I know I do. Um, but, you know, it'd be lovely to see more and more folk from the fellowship uh, being involved. Uh, and the great thing about reading is that you've got all the words in front of you. You don't have to remember anything. So it'd be great to see more and more folk involved uh, in doing a reading on a Sunday morning as part of our worship. That's all by way of announcement. We have, of course, gathered to worship the Lord. And I just want us uh, to begin uh, by reflecting uh, these, these verses within the Psalms. <clears throat> I've actually lost my place. <laughs> it's from Psalm 81, the first few verses. This is what the psalmist writes. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music, strike the tambourine, play the melodious harp and lyre. We have come to worship God today and we want to praise him with all our being and during our service we will be singing songs of praise and we're delighted that Gemma's with us today to provide the music and I'll be accompanying her of course on the drums. But today we're here to praise God, to really worship him with all our hearts and we'll do that just in a few moments but let's just take a moment to pray. Let's pray first. Loving Father, we praise you and thank you for your presence with us today. And Father, we praise you that we have so much to thank you for, the gift of life, the gift of family and friends, and what a joy it is to be part of your church family here, and, right, and part of the family right across the world that you have called to yourself. So Father, as we have gathered in your name, we pray that we will know your presence and Lord, we ask that all we do will give glory to Jesus, our Saviour. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand now and sing our opening praise, the Lord's my shepherd.
Well, boys and girls, it's good to see you here today. And I have a question for you, but it's a question that maybe all of us ask at some time of our lives. What does God want me to do? It's a very important question that we should all think about at some point. And today we're going to think a bit about what God would want you and I to do. And so to help us do this, we're going to begin by looking at these words. Can, now, they're all quite small words, but there's something unique about these words, and it's the fact that they have more than one meaning. So, the top word on the list, bat, has two meanings. Who can tell me one meaning of the word bat? Shout it out. Say again. The animal, yes. The one that flies about and apparently goes into your hair, though I've never met anyone where the bat actually went into their hair, but we always worry about it, don't we? And where we used to live in Newmills in the evening, at certain times of the year, we could see the bats swooping down and flying around the manse, and that was just amazing. So yes, a bat can be an animal. What else can it be? If you know it, shout it out. A cricket bat, yes, of course. And there are other bats we play sport with as well. So bat has two meanings. What about box? What's one meaning of box? We all know what a box is, don't we? But we're just very shy this morning, I think. Okay, one meaning of a box. Cardboard box, yes, that we can put things in. And we still have a few cardboard boxes in our garage since we've moved. Uh, okay, another meaning of box. Yes, when somebody boxes somebody ear, somebody's ears, but I don't, hopefully there'll be not any of that going on in church today. Okay, on to bank then, another word that has more than one meaning. So one meaning of bank, shout it out. A what bank? A river bank, yes, excellent. Excellent, okay, and another meaning, actually there's more than two meanings, but if you give me one, that'll, another one, that'll be great. Another meaning for bank, uh, exactly, yes. Somewhere where we put our money. Okay, two meanings, um, for the word dash, uh, and this actually, one that pops into my head, you know, there is a character dash in a, a particular movie that I'm sure a lot of you have seen. There's a character uh, in the movie, The Incredibles, isn't that right? The little guy, and he dashes about, amazing. But let me think, let me think now for a moment about other meanings of dash. Well, actually, if you think about him, that tells you what one of the meanings is, doesn't it? Somebody who runs about very, very fast. What's another meaning for dash? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes, thanks, Paul. That's great. Pebble dash, which was one I hadn't thought of, funny enough. <laughs> and of course, sometimes you've a hyphenated word. Uh, you get a dash, which is a hyphen in between. Although, apparently, they're going, they're going out. There's not many words where you see a hyphen actually used now. Okay, on to fast, which is a wee bit like dash too. Two, two meanings of fast. Number one. Whenever you go without food, you fast, don't you? Or obviously like dash, you can run fast, you can do things fast in a speedy sort of way. And then finally, two meanings for the word light. Yeah, what's light? Well, if we, if we didn't have light, we wouldn't be able to see each other here. Now, sure we wouldn't whether we, the sun wasn't shining or the, the, the electric lights weren't on. So that's one meaning of light. Now, another meaning of light. Say again. Lightweight. Exactly, yes. Lightweight. Okay, so lots of words that have at least two different meanings. Now, here is another word that has at least two meanings. So who can tell me one meaning... For bold. Now, I'm not talking, we're not talking about the, the powder you put in the washing machine here. Uh, two other meanings for the word bold. One meaning would be good to start with. Say, being rude, did you say? Yes, because I still remember, and it was a long time ago, I remember my mum saying to me, don't you be so bold now. And I think a few of us have heard, heard that, haven't we? Uh, another meaning for bold? 
Bold writing. There it is. Bold writing. Bold type. Let's go back to that question that we started with. What does God want me to do? Well, what I want to tell you today, boys and girls, that he wants us to be bold. He wants us to be bold. He doesn't want us to be rude. He wants us to be courageous. He wants us to be really strong in our faith and really believe in God and let others see that. Just the way that the bold type stands out whenever we see it on a page or on the computer screen, it really stands out, doesn't it? Jesus wants us to stand out for him. He wants us to be really bold for him. That's what he wants each of us to do. And how can we do that? Well, first of all, we believe in Jesus. We put our trust in him. We obey Jesus. We don't just read or listen to what he says. We actually put it into action. We do something that shows that we love him. And that's the third thing we must do. We must love God, but not only him, love others. And that doesn't just mean that we tell them that we love them, but we actually do something to show that we love them. And we do what's right. Because every day we face choices. There are temptations that come our way. And sometimes we're tempted to do the wrong thing. But if we know and love Jesus, he wants us to do what's right. So when we believe in him, we obey him, We love God and others and we do what's right. Other people will see that we are God's people. It's by being bold that we show others that we love Jesus. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to be bold. So boys and girls and mums and dads and grandparents, let's remember that this week. Whatever we're doing, remember God wants us to be bold for him. Believing in him, living in obedience, loving him and loving those around us and doing what's right. So let's, let's, make that our, let's make that our goal this coming week to be bold for God. We're going to pray now together. So let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you would not leave us just as we are. You want to change us. You want to make us the people that can be a real blessing to those around us. But what we need to do is put you first. Becoming a Christian means believing in you and obeying what you ask us to do. And you want us to love those around us, not just through our words, but also our actions. You want us to do what's right. So help us, Lord, to be bold for you in all we do during this coming week, that you may have all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And boys and girls, we are going to sing a song now that's all about being bold for Jesus. So let's stand and sing together. And if you know the actions, join in as we sing, be bold, be strong.
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, as we bring before you the needs of others, we remember those known to us who are struggling with health issues at this time. We pray for those receiving medical care, whether in hospital, at an outpatient's clinic, or at home, asking that they would know your healing presence at this time of being laid low. We give you thanks for the care and expertise provided by doctors, consultants, and nurses that can serve to aid the process of healing. We remember those who are being looked after in a residential care home, the nursing staff and carers who tend to their needs, and family members who take the time to visit their loved ones. We remember those within our community who have lost a loved one in recent days. May all who grieve today know your comfort at this time of sorrow. We continue to pray for the situation in Ukraine, giving you thanks for the efforts of aid agencies and churches to provide shelter, food and clothes to those affected by the ongoing conflict with Russian forces. Lord, may those who are seeking to negotiate a peaceful resolution make progress soon so that this war may be brought to an end and lives spared. We continue to pray for our own nation with regard to the political situation that continues to cause much frustration for everyone, especially with our health service continuing to be under immense pressure and waiting lists for essential health care growing day by day. Lord, we pray that a way will be found for a working assembly to be re-established so that the vital work of governing the affairs of our country can be managed in a way that benefits us all. We continue to remember young people who are studying for exams at this time. May they be enabled to cope with the pressures that come with revision and may they get the right balance between their studies and looking after themselves mentally and physically. Lord, most of all, we pray that they will be enabled to trust you throughout this challenging time and be assured that you have a plan for their lives beyond these exams. As we take time now to meditate upon your word, may we be receptive to all you want to say to us. And may we be ready to respond in faith and humble obedience to the challenges that you present to us today through your word. And all this we ask in our Saviour's name. Amen. I'm going to invite Helen now to come and read for us from Genesis chapter 12. The Lord has said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. And so Abraham left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morach at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. Thank you, Helen. We're going to stand again to praise God, this time in the words of the hymn, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness.
Let's just take a moment to pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are here with us now by your Spirit to lead us into all truth. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to hear it. Lord, really, may we really take it in so that we might not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, today uh, we continue our series uh, looking at some of the prominent people of the Old Testament. And last, last Sunday, as we considered some lessons from the life of Adam, we were reminded that through his failure and disobedience, he experienced the damaging consequences of sin. And this would ultimately mean death for him and his wife Eve. But initially it meant that they were banished from the paradise that was Eden. But the account of their fall that we find in Genesis chapter 3 is not all doom and gloom. Despite Adam and Eve's sin, God still loved them. He comes looking for them and then he provides them with clothes to hide the nakedness that they've become aware of. But it's as he judges Satan that we see his love for his fallen, for fallen man most clearly. In verse 15 he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. It may only be a hint, but it's a hint that's full of encouragement and hope. Because God is pointing to a time in the future when a son of Eve, a man born of a woman, will destroy the evil one. In the words of the Church of England cleric, Vaughan Roberts, it is a veiled prophecy of the work of the Lord Jesus. He inflicted defeat on Satan through his death on the cross and will return to complete the job. This is something that the Apostle Paul was very aware of because in his letter to the believers in Rome, he says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And so although we see sin leading to judgment, we can also see evidence of God's grace. And this pattern is repeated throughout the book of Genesis. After he kills Abel, Cain is driven into exile. But God does not completely abandon him. He places a protective mark on Cain and promises that anyone who kills him will be judged. The genealogy or family tree that we find in chapter 5 highlights the fact that successive generations suffered the punishment of death. <clears throat> but the refrain, and then he died, and then he died, is missing from verse 24. There we read that Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more, because God took him away. Words that offer the hope that even in the middle of a fallen world, it is possible to know God and escape the penalty of death. By the time we come to Genesis 6, God seems to have decided to wipe out every living thing because he's seen how great man's wickedness on the earth has become. And so in verse 7 he says, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals, and the creatures that move along the ground, and the birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But, and it's an important but, Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. Or to be more accurate, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Even though Noah is guilty of sin, just like every other person on the planet, God chooses him and his family to be recipients of his grace. And he says to Noah in verse 18, I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. God promises that he will rescue him and his family from the flood. And Noah believes him. He believes him and follows his instruction to the letter. And he and his family are able to, able to survive in the ark as the waters rise. When the waters recede, God makes another promise. In chapter 9, verse 11, he says, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Although human sin continues, God is still committed to his creation. He hasn't finished with his world. 
The flood was an undoing of the created order, but it was followed by a gracious restoration, a new start. This becomes even more apparent whenever you notice the parallel between God's original instructions to Adam in Genesis 1 and his instructions to Noah at the beginning of chapter 9. There we read, Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread you will fall up of, all, of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. And so the great flood and the mercy shown to Noah and his family represent a new beginning. Time and time again throughout the early chapters of Genesis, we see these three elements, sin, judgment, and grace. But that, that pattern appears to be broken when we get to chapter 11, where we read of the people building a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Sin and judgment are certainly there as the people build the Tower of Babel. And then they're scattered. And there's no sign of God's grace. However, that changes when we get to the following chapter, chapter 12. There we read of an encounter between God and a man called Abram, a descendant of Noah's son, Shem. And what amounts to a promise to reverse the effects of his judgment after Babel, God informs Abraham of his intention to choose a people for himself and to bless them. Listen again as I read from verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Throughout the previous chapters of Genesis, there have been hints of what God will do. But here we have the first clear statement of his intentions. He's now entering into a covenant with a man who will be the father of his chosen people. Abraham means exalted father. And through him and his offspring, the world will be blessed. In other words, the world will experience God's favor or grace. Recognizing the significance of this covenant, the renowned evangelical leader, the late John Stott said, it, was truly, it may truly be said without exaggeration that not only the rest of the Old Testament, but the whole of the New Testament are an outworking of these promises of God. There was nothing particularly special about Abram. He was a pagan landowner who'd come from Ur, a town in what is now southeastern Iraq. But through an act of his grace, God chose Abram, later renaming him Abraham, and in so doing, began the process of establishing a people for himself. There are three aspects to the covenant that God made with Abraham. People land and blessing. Under the terms of this agreement, Abraham's descendants would become a great nation that will be God's own people. This is underlined later in Genesis 17 when God says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me, me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And we see these promises repeated throughout the Old Testament in the form, I will be your God and you will be my people. Regarding the promise of land, Abraham was commanded to leave his homeland and go to another land that God would show him. And this would transpire to be Canaan. In chapter 17, verse 8, God says to Abraham, the whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. Abraham's descendants will be blessed, and through them all peoples on earth will be blessed. The curse of the fall would be replaced by the blessing of salvation. Right from the start, God's plan of salvation was universal. It encompassed every nation. 
Abraham's new name reflects this because Abraham means father of many. As a sign of the covenant that God has established with Abraham, every male Israelite child was to be circumcised. This physical mark signifying the special relationship that God has established with his people. It must have been hard for Abraham to believe that all this would happen. But he did. We're told in Genesis 15 verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. This ordinary man who had grown up under the influence of a pagan culture is chosen by God and God is pleased with him because he accepts that what God has said is true. And that is why Abraham is listed among the giants of the faith that we read of in Hebrews chapter 11. Men such as Abel, Enoch and Noah. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, By faith Abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Abraham could not have known what lay ahead of him when he responded to God's instruction to up sticks and travel to another land. But he took God at his word and acted on it. And that is true faith. I wonder if we knew God was expecting us to do something radical. Would we be as quick to trust him and follow through? And so Abraham's response to God's command presents a major challenge to us today. Because the bottom line is this. If, we, if we're to live a life that truly pleases and honors God, we have to trust him completely. That's what faith is. As the writer to the Hebrew says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Abraham was prepared to embark on a journey into the unknown. Would you do that? Abraham did. Why? Because he'd encountered the living God. He knew that he existed. And he believed him when he said he would bless him and his descendants. What about you here today? Do you believe that God exists? And if you do, what does that mean for you? Are you happy to go through life doing your own thing? Hoping that God won't interfere or get in the way too much? Well, friends, if you are, if, that's, if that describes where you're at now, that is a dangerous path. Because it's not good enough to believe that God exists. We need to remember that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. What does it mean to earnestly seek God? Well, it means putting him at the very top of our priority list. When Jesus spoke to his disciples about the worries and concerns they had about everyday life, he said to them, seek first his kingdom, that is God's kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When God looks at you or I, what's he looking for? Well, the same thing he looked for from Adam and Eve. Trust. Trust. Having established a perfect situation here on earth, God gave them everything they needed. But it wasn't enough. They fell for the temptation to have more. And paradise was lost. But although God punished their sin, as he had to, being holy, he put in motion a plan to rescue fallen mankind. And after successive failures of the people to overcome their sinful tendencies, God chose a man to begin the process of establishing a people for himself. A people who would be a vehicle for his blessing to the entire human race. This man, Abraham, heard what God said and believed him. But more than that, he acted on his belief. And the process through which God, God's promise would be fulfilled was begun. Abraham was a man of faith. Not a perfect man, but nevertheless, a man we can learn from. So if you or I really want to live a life that pleases God, a life that makes a difference in the world, then like Abraham, we must give God top priority and we must trust in his promises. As God's people, we are called to live a life of faith 
And of course, that's not always easy. The writer to the Hebrews compares it to running a marathon, which is one of the most grueling challenges a human being can face. Many competitors in such a long race may be tempted to give up before they reach the finishing line. But for those who push on through the pain barrier, there will be the sense of satisfaction and relief that they kept going to the end. What's the key to making it across the finishing line? Well, it's keeping your eyes on the prize. And the prize for most competitors in the marathon is finishing the race. I want you to think of the Christian life as a massive marathon race with millions of people taking part. And you're right there in the middle of the crowds and you're doing your best to keep going. Many years may have passed since you started the race and you find that with every passing stride, you're getting weary. And you may even be thinking, what's the point? Why should I keep going? There are aches and pains and blisters The road has been hard on you and you may even have forgotten why you started the race in the first place. There's no sign of the finishing line and it would be so easy to give up. Maybe today that sums up where you are on the Christian race, the life of faith. If it does, then I want you to listen carefully to these words of encouragement that we find in Hebrews 12. Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, He endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus has run the race of faith. In the midst of the greatest trials anyone could face, he put his trust in his heavenly father and he was not disappointed. His faith was rewarded and today he sits at the right hand of God interceding for us, praying for us, cheering us on towards the finishing line. So as we run this race of faith, a race first run by Abraham, let's keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, so that we will be able to go the distance. And on the day when we cross the finishing line, may we be able to join with the Apostle Paul in saying, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we praise you again for your word to us today. And thank you for the example of Abraham, that man of faith. Far from perfect, but when it mattered, Lord, he trusted in you and you led him forward to the place that you wanted him to go and there were many lessons that he had to learn along that journey times when he doubted you times when he tried to jump ahead and make things happen for himself but at the end of the day he came to realize lord you're the one that we must trust so enable us to have that same kind of faith lord even when we don't know where you're leading us to really believe in you and know that you have what's best for us in mind. Because you are the Alpha and the Omega. You know the end from the beginning. There's nothing that takes you by surprise. And yet for us, there are many things that surprise us along the way. But throughout the journey, Lord, you just simply want us to keep our eyes on Jesus. So may we do that. Whether we're at the beginning of the race or we've traveled quite a distance, and perhaps we're feeling a bit weary. Lord, enable us to keep looking to you, that we might have that grace and that strength to keep running, that we may make it across the finishing line and receive that welcome that awaits us in that heavenly place you're preparing. Lord, thank you and praise you for all that you mean to us and for all that you've promised to do in and through us. May we seek to give you glory in how we live and how we witness to others of our faith in you through our words and actions. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Well, today we've been reminded of God's grace and we're going to sing about that grace now as we stand to sing our closing praise. Lord, I come before your throne of grace and in the chorus we join together in singing. What a faithful God. Let us pray. Loving Father, we praise you and thank you for your goodness to us. And out of uh, the many blessings that you've poured into our lives, we present this offering today, asking that you would take it and use it for the extension of your kingdom and the blessing of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We close with the benediction. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, now and forevermore. Amen.